As a young girl, Diane Reynolds was continually subjected to domestic violence and grew up in a home where drugs, alcohol, and addiction were just a part of life. But rather than just becoming another statistic, Diane found a path that led her to help rescue others from the grip of addiction. In this episode, we're going to learn about the origins of Provoking Hope, an organization that Diane founded in Yamho County that helps individuals and families dealing with addiction through peer-based support and mentors. You'll also learn how Diane's life and career took some unexpected turns that led her to where she is today. You'll learn how Provoking Hope uses a powerful approach to bring real transformation, some of Diane's thoughts on Measure 110, which legalized drug use in Oregon, and some exciting plans in the works for Provoking Hope. Hi, I'm Daniel Roberts, host of the Giving Town Podcast, where we share stories of hope and generosity in Newburgh and the surrounding areas. We live in an amazing community full of incredible people who are working to make Newburgh an even better place to live. This podcast is all about sharing those stories and helping the people in our town be inspired, get involved, and have hope for our future. This podcast is also brought to you by my real estate team, the Joyful Roberts Group. And it's part of our mission to serve this community, not only by providing amazing service to our clients, but to also help Newburgh be an even better place to live. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home anywhere around Newburgh, reach out to us and we would be happy to serve you and take care of you. Well, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this episode with Diane Reynolds as we talk about provoking help. Well, Diane, it's nice to have you on the show today. And it's so funny, whenever I, <laughs> whenever I uh, uh, finally get to an episode with someone that we've been planning for months, it always just feels, um, it's so funny that the time seems so long, far away, and then it, it's actually so close. But anyway, it's great to have you on, and I look forward to sharing with the community about Provoking Hope today. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for having me. You're it's welcome. Privilege. So Provoking Hope, for, for many people, they're probably aware of, of what Provoking Hope is, but some people are not. Some people have probably never heard of Provoking Hope. So can you share a little bit about what Provoking Hope is and, and why it's so important mm-hmm. for our community so Provoking Hope is essentially a nonprofit that was established in the year of 2011. And that was the year that I was ordained as a pastor through the Nazarene Church in McMinnville. And at that time, I thought I probably would be having, you know, a church. <laughs> Um, but I have since learned and accepted that my call was not to a local church, but instead it was to a community, mm. a county, um, Yam Hill County at large. And the purpose and the importance of Provoking Hope really stems around this statement that we are here to provide a path for individuals to find recovery, to come in whether they are in recovery or not, but to have a safe place to learn how to walk the path of recovery with individuals who have already walked that path Mm. and have at least two years of experience of being in recovery having completed 80 hours of training and are certified as certified recovery mentors. So you started out thinking you were going to be a pastor (laughs) and somehow got into helping people find Mm -hmm. recovery from alcohol and drugs and all kinds of um, substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? What was that process like going when you realized, oh, this is... (laughs) <laughs> like what did that look like? You're that. I mean, you said it felt like a calling, right? So, a lot of that wraps up in my own upbringing, my own childhood, my own life experiences. Uh, my mom and dad both were alcoholics mm. and speed users. Um, I'm not an alcoholic, and I'm not a an addict of chemicals. Uh, there have been things in my life that I would call an being addiction, but it wasn't either one of those things. So I grew up in a as the oldest child of a very large family. At least it felt large to me. There were five of us, five children, and I was the oldest. <laughs> and my dad was absent. My mom was 
absent most of the time, and when she wasn't, she was high or drunk. So I grew up in those childhood years learning um, how it feels to live in a home with no structure, no hope, um, absent tea parent. And that really was the driving point. It really was. It was... um, um, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't. I didn't understand this as a child, but looking back now over my life, I recognize that every step of the way, God had me exactly where He wanted me, and my DNA that He gave me was to be the child of that family. Hmm. And I just today can accept that and know that while He didn't want that for me. It's what it's what I was handed through my parents, and he has led me to always be somebody who cared. Sometimes I cared too deeply. Uh, codependency was one of my addictions, um, and led me into you know I I had a first marriage that was very violent. Sixteen years, four children, wow. um, and. Uh, domestic violence was the key to that relationship. Led me then to Oregon, because at that time we were in Southern California, led me to Oregon, where people began to say, "Uh, this is not okay. (laughs) Nobody in Southern California paid much attention to the obvious signs of what was happening in closed doors. So I had my childhood, and I married into what seemed familiar, and I recognized, which was violence, <laughs> and um, and then came to Oregon, and I b- really believe God called me to Oregon. I was a Christian for the last ten years of that sixteen-year marriage. Mm. Uh, I believe He called me to Oregon because in Oregon somebody would say, "This is not okay." Yeah. In the state of Oregon. That's actually against the law. <laughs> and nobody had ever said that to me because that had, was what I was familiar with for all of my years up to that point. So I came to Oregon. I was here just one year, and, um, and that marriage ended. Hmm. And then I was a single mom with these four children <laughs> for about three and a half years. And then I went to work at Evergreen over in McMinnville. And there I met my current husband, who I have been married to for 41 years. Wow. (laughs) And he moved into our lives and became the dad that my children needed, the husband that I had never experienced before in my life. All the time, I'm still very compassionate about brokenness and dysfunctionality and I did my own path of recovery spent about nine years doing uh, recovery counseling in Milwaukee Oregon and then started that process of educating myself to become a pastor and God just very gently said your congregation will be on the concrete Hmm. Your church and your pulpit will be the cement. And I just couldn't understand. And so, you know. What did that what did that look like or, or feel like that? You felt like you heard mm-hmm. that? I, what is, was that I heard like, like? A, 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 the whisper. And, you know, I've been, I've been a Christian since 1970. So through many valleys and many difficult, hard places in my personal travel, God has been there with me. He has always walked beside me. He has spoken whispers to me, you know, go this way, go that way. No, don't do that. Um, And I've just learned to respond to him and to accept that that's his voice. I know his voice. Uh, Hmm. The Bible says the shepherd knows his kids and his kids know his voice. So I know his voice. And so I wasn't exactly sure what that meant, quite frankly. And um, people have always accused me of kind of having 
John Wesley blood <laughs> flowing through my veins um, because of some of the things we've done. We, After we grew my children up, um, our house was empty. We were going to sell it. And one day God whispered, what if I want to use that house? <laughs> and I was on the freeway. I had to get off the freeway. It shook me up so much. Wow. I got off the freeway and said, what exactly do you mean? And he said, I want to use that house. So I didn't know what that meant. But six weeks later, I told my husband that I'd heard that, that comment. And he said, well, that's not all. So for six weeks, he likewise had been <laughs> being spoken to. We were not going to sell the house. We were going to use that house uh, for God's purpose. And so for three, four and a half years, we moved <laughs> addicts and alcoholics into our home and lived with them wow. <laughs> um, in Dayton. And then the same voice said, um, it's now time for you to go to university and get your uh, pastoral degree, and uh, that's the next step. So, again, <laughs> I just have learned to follow his leading and do what he asks of me, and I can fuss at him, and I can, <laughs> I can say I don't understand, and he just says, trust me. And every time I've done that, it's turned out good. So that led to us filling the house up. I believe that was part of where we kind of cut our teeth on the understanding. Not that I didn't have some understanding because I'd grown up in all of those situations. Anyway, I, at that point, educated myself and, like I said, thought that I would have a church. <laughs> And when I got finished with the education, was ordained through the services of the local church. Um, then again, the whisper came and said, "You know, you're not. There's not going to be a church. It's a, your church is a community, and I've called you to uh, walk the concrete and be on the cement with the people." And the cement people, concrete people. And so I just sat in that for a while. We had already had the four and a half years with 79 different adults who went through our program. Uh, we called it Stormwalker. And so I kind of had a hint. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I just said, okay. <laughs> Give me some, uh, give me some word, or, or or send me somebody. And one day, Judge Collins from the court system called and said, "Hey, I would like to have a meeting with you, and I'm wondering if you would go out and have dinner with me and a few people." The Stormwalker House had closed, and he said, "Would you open Stormwalkers back up?" And I said, "No." <laughs> <laughs> And he said, well, why not? And I said, because a higher power told me we were finished with that. And so I can't go against that unless he says to do it. And he said, well, tell him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I don't get to tell him. He gets to tell me. So <laughs> anyway, he, you know, he said, well, would you do something in the community where, he said, because you guys were successful. What you were doing was success, success. And there are people today who are still living in recovery because of having been at your stormmarker house. I said, well, I'll consider that and pray about it. And that really was the beginning. I went to dinner with him, um, a K. Chase, who was a uh, physician, lady, uh, uh, female doctor, um, a anesthesiologist named Dr. McMasters, and several uh, different people. I think there were like six or seven of us who went to dinner together. And initially, it was going to be uh, to develop some sort of a rehab program. Mm -hmm. That summer of 2011. 
I performed the burial services for 16 young men and women who passed away due to overdose. And I just said to God, I can't do this. I can't just bury people. And if that's what this is about, there's been a big mistake. Um, and I was just crying. I, I mean, I just, I just knew I couldn't do it. I said, my heart can't handle it anymore. And there was that voice that said, look to the right. I was parked in my car because I was crying so hard. I just left one of them services, and I looked over to the right, and there was a for rent sign there. So just by impulse, I dialed the number, and I said, the person, I said, he answered, he was an attorney, and I said, I think I'm sitting in front of your building that's for rent, and... Uh, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I can come right around. So I said, well, let me call my husband first. So I called my <laughs> husband. I said, could you come and meet me? And I said, I think I'm sitting like on Evans Street or something. And he said, sure. So he came down and met me. And Mark Byerly was the attorney. Took us down into this very dark basement <laughs> uh, and showed us this space. It was about 300 square feet. And he said, this is what I have. So I looked at Bob and I said, my husband, I said, well, what do you think? He said, I think we need to rent this. So I asked Mark what it would cost us to rent it. He told us and Bob said, we can handle that for a while. So for that, from 2011 until 2014, <laughs> it was complete volunteerism and we hmm. And I didn't know this when we went into the basement. We were right across the street from Health and Human Services, Behavioral Health, and right around the corner from the courthouse. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we were just right there close to where all the activity happens. The jail's there. The probation officer office was there. And uh, so we just... Went down there and set up. I, we opened up on uh, the 11th of October, and our 17th of October of 2011, and had no furniture, <laughs> had no money. Bob and I paid the rent for those first three or four years, and people donated furniture to us. And in 2014, Silas Halloran Steiner walked across the street. He was at that time the uh, guy in charge of behavioral health. And he said, came in. And I mean, I recognized him because I, we'd been sitting in courtrooms and things. And what at the, at this time, what was, was it provoking hope? Like, did it have that name? Uh -huh, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it had that name. And, and you know, a little piece. Uh, about that was from the time we met with the folks who invited me to dinner, we said, okay, every month let's plan on meeting together. And every month there has to be more people hmm. joining us. And so if we can get through 12 months planning, and if every month there's more people, then we know that this is what we're supposed to do. That was kind of my decision. And so they all agreed. And by the time we got to the last month of the 12-month period, we had to ask the Newburgh Nazarene if they would allow us to hold the meeting in their sanctuary hmm. because we had 189 people wow. who were interested. And um, so from there, you know, we just kept moving forward. We you know, made the decision to not do a rehab center, but instead to think more about, and they didn't have, there were not in, in 2011, they didn't know, they didn't call people peers. There wasn't certified recovery mentors mm -hmm. that none of that had happened in our society yet. We just were there volunteering and mentoring people and, uh, giving them a safe place to be in between court appointments or PO and court appointments or attorney and PO appointments. So they would come in. So we began providing a lunch for them because 
they don't have any money uh, when they're first trying to get clean that you know they have pretty well exhausted um, the, the people that we are working with in the beginning mm -hmm. so that is how we began <laughs> so, so and we'll, when, we'll when Silas walked in uh, he said uh, what are you doing over here are you slinging dope or what <laughs> He said, there's always this line of people to come in your building. And I said, no, we're slinging hope, <laughs> not dope. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm here to ask you, would you like to earn some money to sling some hope? And I said, what? <laughs> because my dream was small. It always was small. It was, it wasn't what I what it is today. I, I that is not. That was not my intent, nor my goal, nor my purpose when we began. My goal was to just be obedient and do what was asked of me. And people liked me. Um, I think, you know, we know that the Spirit of God lives in us if we live for Him. And I think that's what they were attracted to. I think it had very little to do with me. I just became the the jar that houses you know all of this love and what I what I have to give um, and they were drawn to that and they needed they needed that they needed to know that somebody would value them somebody would remember their name somebody would hand their car keys and say I'd like you to go run an errand for me and here's my credit card hmm. and there's my car and here's my keys and they would just look shocked and say, uh, do you know <laughs> what I've done? <laughs> yes, I do. I do. I do know. But you haven't done it to me at this point. So I trust you and I'll trust you as long as you give me a reason to trust you. So it's grown from that to where we are today. And today... 14 years later almost, we're looking at fulfilling that first dream, which was the rehab center. Yeah. Uh, and so people need to know, no judgment. We're not the heat. We're all recovering. We're just, we're, we're you. We're you. And so come and sit down beside us. Um, process with us. We'll walk with you. We'll go to the courtroom with you. We'll even go into jail and meet with you um, because you have value, because of your, your human being, and you have value. And I think that that is really the call, and it is what has made it successful. Yeah. Uh, and it has been successful, but I, I just believe that the success is gods <laughs> um, and people just being obedient and saying this is what I want to do so we have these 68 people they're the most amazing uh, people I've ever worked around in my life <laughs> and so you know how 68 people that are working and are these volunteers or are these employees? no they're actually employed so we have grants and um, the county pays us we have a contract with the county we have contract with the state of Oregon through the child protection services and uh, we are part of the M110 burn grant <laughs> um, and so yeah and so when people how do people typically find out about you is it through they go through the system they, they go through the system some way and then find like okay I need to get recovery and they refer to you mm -hmm. do people come on your own on their own so I kind of, um, I love this statistic. 25% uh, of our people who walk through the door are either uh, advised to connect with us from a probation, a, a judge, a police officer, or a, their uh, chemical dependency counselor. Uh, but almost 75% of the people come by word of mouth hmm. from their own community because the addiction community is a community within itself. It, it, 
it, it's here in our county, but they talk to each other. They do through AA and NA, all of the 12-step traditions. Um, and they say, well, you should go check out this place. Or you, Oh, you, got, you, you have to do a community service. You should go do that at Provoking Hope. You know, they have car washes in the summer. And man, you can earn eight hours of community service doing mm-hmm. something like that. Um, so most of them come to us either through a family connection or through their uh, community connection. And we keep track of that on, on a monthly basis to be able to prove that, uh, have the evidence that most of them come um, by a great act of courage. I say the greatest act of courage they, they make is to walk through the front door of our lobby. And there, if we're doing our job, they meet a, a no-judgment zone. They meet people who say, hey, can I get you a cup of coffee? Are you hungry? I'll make you a sandwich. Uh, the tomorrow, why don't you come at eleven thirty? Because we serve hot meals mm-hmm. at eleven thirty, and yeah. So that's you know, people are hearing about it. In the, those are the different ways. Yeah, and I like the name, provoking hope. I'm curious the the story behind that. But for someone to be in addiction. And to even take that step to say, okay, I need help. There has to be an amount of hope there because (laughs) people typically don't just say, I think I'm going to try drugs today and go down that path. There's (laughs) something in their life where typically it gets to the point where they say, I don't have hope. And therefore the only thing I can do is try to numb these feelings Feelings. and and Mm -hmm. try to get out of it. So to say, I want to try to get better, like (laughs) that's, that's that's a tough thing to right. be willing to do. Right. So what does that what does that look like? I mean, so people come in. They're I guess another question, oh, another way of looking at that is like, what makes provoking hope unique to where people are willing to, to come in? The fact I think that these are people that they used to use with, the hmm. people that they hung out in the trap houses with, and now they see them and they're like going. Whoa, what happened to you? You know, well, probably can help happen to me. <laughs> you know, I, I came and I began to understand that I could have a choice. I could choose not to live like that anymore. Recovery is real and you can have it. I have it. Uh, and I think that that is the thing that makes it unique. It's different than walking into behavioral health where you're meeting a clinician who has book understanding and some of them have the um, some of them have the background of the history of being an addict but um, there's not a lot much to talk about that yeah whereas with a peer who's sitting right beside you who's traveled the same same road, they're able not only to listen to you, but they're also able to say, oh, man, I remember how that felt. Mm. Oh, wow, I, I, so, I so understand. And you have it pretty unique where every one of your employees is actually, they've gone through addiction and they're right. in recovery. Correct. So can you share about some of the, what, you know, some people might say, oh, well, you got people who are addicts helping addicts, but you have a special way of going about it to make sure, like, no, these are actually, um, you know, it's not just someone gets off drugs one day, the next day yeah. they're helping other people. They have to be clean and sober for two solid years with evidence that it has to be proven. Then they have to do the 80 hours of education for getting certified. That usually takes, you know, um, another month or two at least <laughs> um, and then they come and apply for their job and then we put them in what we call a shadowing role they shadow a more experienced person who has many more years of recovery than they do and so they shadow and le- learn the actual touch touch of what we do 
And some of them, you know, it, every story is not a success story. 68 of them are a success story. And we, right now we have about 39 who have been employed by us. Hmm. Um, so our mission for our employees is to bring them in, raise them up, equip them, and send them. Hmm. So we have about 39 that we've sent out into the community to other positions, to other wow. jobs for other organizations. Um, and they all know that that's one of the things that is our mission. And some of them choose to um, be sent to Provoking Hope and mm-hmm. to expand and become, um, you know, move up the levels. And so we have a full management team and uh, we have an executive team, and then the rest of them are uh, CRMs that serve. We serve. We have uh, right now. We have three residential homes of our own that um, are like transitional homes, and one males only, and the other two are for women. And um, yeah, so they are not ever matched up with somebody who isn't solid. Hmm. So part of the solidness, now they may enter in through data entry or they may enter in through janitorial, and then we just watch, you know, and see. Like I said, every every story is not successful. Sometimes people have to let go or they leave because they can't handle being around all that healthiness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know we're running, getting yeah. close to the... Um, end of our time. So there are a few more questions I wanted to ask. One of them is a, a bit of a hot button topic with the measure 110. Mm-hmm. And there's been, um, I think the ideal version of what people th- thought it was going to be able to do didn't quite happen. You have this, it's, it's hard because it's a very complicated issue. You have on the one hand is the best thing for people on drugs to be put in jail. No. Mm-hmm what happens when it's it's completely legalized and there's no ramifications at all for for drug use and you have people you know who may not have done drugs now now doing drugs so it's a very it's a very complicated thing but you're in the middle of it so it's one thing for citizens to say oh this or that but you see Mm -hmm. these people on and everyone in provoking hope sees these people on a daily basis so kind of what's your boots on the ground impression Mm -hmm. of of where we're at and, and maybe what's needed. Right. So I think if you ask the the employees, each of them would say, uh, jail was what jerked a knot in their tail. Hmm. They didn't like being in jail. They didn't want to be in jail. And jail is where they had their come to Jesus moment. Um, and they do not agree with the stipulation that um, jail is not the right place, hmm. <laughs> which is often surprising even to me to hear my employees say things like that. But here's what I know for sure. We all need some sense of responsibility and accountability. And when you take away the, when you decriminalize that they can be using out in public, that they that they aren't going to face any ramification if they're caught with, you know, a certain amount of their drug on their person or in their pocket. You remove the ability for people to be held accountable. Mm-hmm. And when people commit a crime, that's what they're punished for. They're not punished because they're an addict. And that's kind of a... a um, It's a faulty belief that's out there in our social world is that we're uh, putting people in jail because they're addicts or alcoholics. But that isn't the case. The case is they broke the law. And we all have the need to be held accountable. I mean, it's in it's in us because we're human beings. Um. Now, there may be some people who don't have that in them. Uh, They may have burned out that part of their consciousness. 
but the larger majority of people need to know I can go this far. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when I step across there, you know, I've asked for what I get. <laughs> and I often tell people, you know, I've never sat with a six year old ever. In 76 years, I've never sat with a six-year-old and had that six-year-old say to me, when I grow up, I want to be the best doggone drug addict on my neighborhood. (laughs) Children don't think like that. And somewhere, something, like you said earlier, something happened to them in their childhood that set them on that path. And they're stuck there. They're stuck. If that happened when they were six or seven and their parent handed them the drug or handed them the bottle to drink from. Um, They're stuck. If they became an addict, they, you know, so if they, if they became an addict when they were seven or eight or nine or 10 or even 13, that's where they are. When they started drinking and that became an uncontrollable thing for them, they're, they're stuck at that age. And, they, they can grow up and go to school and get a job, but the core of their being is stuck back there where they began to numb out emotions and feelings. And um, that is the greater help that they need. Using drugs and alcohol, in my opinion, is a symptom. It's a symptom of something rooted much deeper in the soul, in the heart of the the person. And that's how we best help them. That's how we best walk a path with them, is helping them come to see what was it. What, Mm -hmm. you know, most of them just think like I felt. So it never occurred to me that violence was not the natural thing. Mm. Husbands beat up wives. That's what I believed. That's how they show us that they love us. Wow. Isn't that awful? So you think the same thing in connection with a drug addict. They grow up in a family where the parents are handing the alcohol. Now, it's not true in all families, but for the hardcore addict who's been an addict for 20 years of their 30, (laughs) Uh, that's what they believe, and they have to be. They have to begin to understand and to work on attacking that faulty belief. This is not the way everybody else lives. Yes, in your family, that's how people live. And I don't know. You know, I think it was just for me. It was God who saved me from using or drinking. I I don't know because it never. I, it was never something I thought of hmm. to, to uh, numb out my emotions or my feelings. Instead, I became codependent and a compassionate, compassion's freak, I guess you would say, uh, trying to rescue people all the time. And I'm not in the rescue business. I'm in the transformation business and the redemption business. And I believe that given the opportunity and chance, everybody can choose to change their life and interrupt whatever it is that has caused them to fall into that place where they fell into. So how can how can people support Provoking Hope or, or get involved in some way? So we... You know, we do. We have lots of opportunity. We people can donate to the organization. It's a it's a um, state of Oregon uh, recognized charity, uh, so they can make donations. They we do lots of volunteer opportunities. Um, we have, uh, you know, as we move forward, even in this towards this new rehab. Uh, center. I mean, we're going to have buildings that have, uh, and I want it to be pole barns because I don't want anything fancy. I want them to just feel like they've walked from here to there, and it's just feeling safe and comfortable, uh, not ritzy because 
that isn't what they're familiar with <laughs> at this point. So volunteering, we have a website, www.provokinghope.com. And there's a lot of great information on that, too. <laughs> yeah, um, and there's a donation button. Uh, we, we are always in need of, because we provide a, a lunch every single day of the week, so any donations uh, of bread or peanut butter or jelly, um, things to make soups with. We do crock pot. We don't have a kitchen, so we do crock pot meals. Uh, providing a meal, bringing a meal or getting on a schedule to provide a meal to the lobby um, people is another way. We need blankets. We need hygiene kits. We need, you know, I've often said, if we didn't have to buy 10 cases of paper <laughs> a month, that would be an amazing donation. <laughs> you know, even one case of paper because, the, you know, they, they have uh, files that they have to create when people come in, keep track and do a soak note and all that stuff. Um, so just everything that you could think of, pencils. <laughs> uh, we've had individuals who have bought two or three laptops and given them mm -hmm. to us. Um, yeah, we're pretty receptive to whatever the community wants to offer in the way of helping. And can you share a little bit about the new rehab center? That like, mm -hmm. What is the vision for that? So the vision is two or three, a, a two to five acres, <laughs> and for um, individuals to be able to come and have a place to detox, which would be medically monitored. Um, so detox is usually about five to six days. And then instead of us having to transport people to a treatment facility, which is what we do now. Hmm. Last year, in the, in the year of 2023, we transported 138 people either to Baker City, Hermiston, or um, the one over there by this uh, town over there by the border of Idaho. Um, I can't think of the name of it. It starts with an O. We transported hmm. people for treatment. We also have to transport people into for do detox from this county. So the closest detox is Otis or Portland, wow. which which takes a full day. <laughs> uh, but like the Baker City, which is the one that we transfer transfer mostly, most of our people who need residential care, we transport them to the either the Hermiston or the Baker City, and that's. A day and a half, <laughs> and lots of gas <laughs> yeah. to get over there. So being able to have a place located uh, within Yamhill County, it's time for Yamhill County to understand <laughs> that we need a rehab center. And so we need a place where people can come and detox under medic medical uh, supervision, we need a place where for individuals who are coming out of prison because of their addiction, they've committed a crime, they're coming out of prison, or they're coming out of our county jail, they've spent 30 or 60 days there, <clears throat> and then we turn them loose and they, they don't have any place to land, so they could come to... Uh, the center and receive a bed, uh, a family, <laughs> you know, people who would who would be there for them, and then they could get on that pathway for a new career. Um, yeah, so we have a guy who's the point man at our um, men's house over in Amity, and he was a just a auto mechanic on his own, <laughs> and in his addiction. And um, so he contacted me yesterday and he said, uh, you know, I've been, I've been doing this auto mechanic thing. He lives in our house and monitors the house. He said, I've been doing this mechanic thing thinking oh, that's just what I would do. But you know what, Diane, I think I need to be a CRM. Hmm. 
And so I'm just wondering. Is Remember with the CRM. Can... Certified recovery mentor. Okay. And he said, I love this work, working with these men, seeing the successes in their lives. That's what I need to do. So instead of being a mechanic, I want to. I want to pursue this certified recovery mentor process. And would there be a place on staff for me then? And I said, absolutely. You know, so he's a man who came out of prison two and a half years ago. And he's been mechanicking on the side Mm -hmm. and walking his path of recovery and doing his treatment requirements and his meetings. And now he's ready to give back. So the, our director of operations is talking to him today to see, you know, you want to come be on staff and we have a role for you. He'd be great for, we have prison in reach. So we write letters, we send postcards in, we make the connection while they're still inside, meet them at the prison door. We meet people at the jail door when they release them there, walk them over to the probation department, over to behavioral health, down to provoking hope, uh, get them attached to a certified recovery mentor. Um, so he said, so I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping he's going to say, yes, I want to do that. <laughs> and um, the other thing they have to do is they have to go through a, DHS Child Protective Service background check. Mm. It's intense and it is deep. So they every state they've ever lived in, every county they've lived in in the state of Oregon, all of everything gets background approved. And mm. if we can't get them background approved, then they can't work with our peer client. Okay, they can work in the office and do office work but they can't work with a peer client okay well the last question i appreciate your time and you sharing the story okay. of provoking hope and the last question i'd like to ask is um what gives you hope for and i usually ask about the uh, about newberg specifically but i'll open up to all of yam hill county so what gives you hope for for a future in our county at large um to be able to com- com- combat the addiction and that's number one number two is to combat the stigma Hmm. to be able to say I have 68 plus 39 evidences that if we will go that extra little moment with a person they can break a terrible habit they can give back to their community They can pay taxes. They can buy a home. They can buy a car. (laughs) They can be productive in our community. And they have lived experience that will outlast those of us who never struggled with those addictions. Uh, They're survivors. They're strong. And um, so the first is to you know, battle the addiction, especially fentanyl, which is so deadly right now. And, you know, I I met with a lady right before I came here, her and her husband, who are interested in what they can do to help. And she said she was coming out of church on Sunday morning, and two couples, a, a male and a female together, walked in different directions. She was sitting in her car waiting for her husband to come out. These two couples, male, females, walked in different directions out of the sanctuary into the parking lot. And she said they had, she didn't know what it was. She said they had this this foil and they had a tube (laughs) and Hmm. right in the church parking lot. And I said, yeah, that's measure 110, allows them to do that. So that was probably fentanyl Hmm. that they were snorting. Wow. So it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And and what gives you hope that we can beat it? Yes, I believe we can beat it. I believe that it's the enemy (laughs) uh, of us. Mm -hmm. And he is already defeated, right? Mm. So we just have to be willing to set our stigma aside and forget about 
what we may have as a faulty belief about whatever the stigma is that we have and just say, what can I do to help? And the community has the solutions. <laughs> they do. Mm -hmm. They have good hearts. They have compassion on board. And, but they also have some stigma. And they believe things that are just not true about individuals who get into addiction lifestyle. So I think stigma is the second big thing that we're trying to bust in this in in our in our community, and it's relevant in Newburgh. It's relevant in McMinnville, West Valley, my little town that I live in of Dayton. It's everywhere you go it's there and if you think that your children are not being exposed to it you are acting in a, in the way that an ostrich does by burying your head <laughs> and it's everywhere it's in our schools i have teenage grandkids that are going to school and it's there i have uh children who we have a family program um Responsible Families Program, and those little children have gone through awful things in a home that's racked with drugs and alcohol and, and yeah. Well, Dan, I wish we had more time to keep talking about <laughs> Provoking Hope and the programs you offer. Um, I know we are at the uh, end of our time and you've got a, another yeah. appointment you've got to run to. <laughs> but thank you so much for uh, joining me today on the podcast and for all you do in the community. It's You're, you're making a huge difference. Thank you so much. And for listening, for yeah. listening to that voice. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for tuning in to the Giving Town Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend who you think might benefit from hearing it. While more and more people are continuing to hear about this podcast, I still need your help to spread the message about all the people and organizations that make Newberg so great. Well, thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next episode.